All right, so I guess we're ready to start. So this is the course about Lie group weights and multiplicative structures. I have only a couple of slides, so I'll be mostly using the, the blackboards. And um, so some people asked about lecture notes, so I decided to be um, ecological and I'll just make my notes available online, so I'll ask the local organizers to help me out with that and just put them online. And um, we'll save some paper and some trees. Um, and the main reason for that is that I don't think they were particularly useful because they were very sketchy. So I preferred not to print out um, so you know all, all, all these notes um, for basically no reason. And um, so let me also thank the local organizers for all the hard work. So let me start by <coughs> just telling you a bit of what my goals um, are. So basically, um, there are two things that I would like to discuss in this series of lectures. So the first one is to describe a number of in instances in which geometrical structures are coupled with group-like structures. And by group-like here, I will mean um, on Lie groupoids, and I'll have to introduce Lie groupoids later on. And um, and the you no, know, and basically, I'll be I'll be interested in the interplay between these geometrical structures on groupoids and their infinitesimal counterparts, the infinitesimal geometry associated with them. And the second goal is to use uh, multiplicative structures on groupoids as a lead-in into you know, Poisson geometric related objects that I think are, oops, are relevant and will be, I think, in many talks um, next week. So for example, um, the type of structures that will show up naturally here are, you know, besides Lie groupoids and Lie algebroids, um, Lie bialgebroids, Dirac structures, current algebroids, so I think many of you have heard about them and many of you even know about them well. So I, I think this just gives uh, you know, a way to, to get to, to all of them. <coughs> and um, the third point is that there will be many connections, I guess, between this mini course and the other mini courses. So in particular, um, with the problem of symplectic realizations that Rui already discussed a bit and also with the finite dimensional approach to describe the symplectic nature of modular space of flat connections as in Anton's talk. So, you know, multiplicative structures play a role in this context as well. So, as for the structure of the lectures, so I think most what I'll talk about will revolve around a certain correspondence that I will explain today. And this is the correspondence between Poisson structures on the one hand and objects known as symplectic groupoids. So um, this is a kind of, you know, this kind of correspondence is in the same spirit as the correspondence between Lie algebras and Lie groups in the sense that one is something infinitesimal, the other one is something global. And in fact, we already saw that we can see Lie algebras in a way as Poisson manifolds by looking at their duals. So these were the KKS Poisson structures that Anton talked about. They also showed up in Ruiz talks. So in a way, you know, this, this correspondence um, includes the correspondence between Lie algebras and Lie groups if you see Lie algebras as Poisson manifolds. Okay? So, <clears throat> um, this object, as we'll see, is of importance for the global study of Poisson manifolds in the spirit of Ruiz stocks. For example, they are examples themselves of symplectic realizations of Poisson manifolds. Um, and, and, and they codify, they encode a lot of the Poisson geometry properties um, of the, you know, of the manifold they, in a way, globalize. 
So um, basically, the game I think I'll be I'll be playing here is um, so this is a very particular kind of multiplicative stru structure. Namely, it's a closed two form that is non-degenerate. It's a symplectic form that is compatible with a group-like structure. And you can start wondering, you know, what happens if you change or generalize this to something, for example. Uh, more general Poisson structures or forms which are not closed or forms that are not non-degenerate. There are many ways in which you can generalize very natural the geometry of the global object. And I think most of what I'll be trying to do is tell you how this extends or changes or generalizes you know, the, the infinitesimal part of the picture. So you know, playing this game you're going to see lots of generalizations of Poisson structures of interest. Okay, so that's the that's the perspective. <clears throat> okay, so this is the plan for the lectures. I don't know how much I'll be able to follow it, but um, the first lecture today, um, I'll just introduce um, the very first examples of multiplicative structures, and I'll have to include in this lecture what a Lie group point is. That's where multiplicative structures will be defined. Um, the second lecture will be about the infinitesimal counterparts of whatever I talk about today, right? So it will be already some generalizations of this correspondence. It will include this correspondence and something a bit more general. Um, the third lecture will be about even more general multiplicative objects. And the fourth lecture, I'm not sure yet. So we'll see how, how far I get. So. Uh, the outline for the very first lecture for today, which is just you know an introduction to the first examples of multiplicative structures, will include um, objects known as Poisson Lie groups. Then I'll move on and talk about groupoids in general, just define groupoids in general. Then I'll talk about I'll, I'll couple Lie groupoids with symplectic structures, and these are the symplectic groupoids. And finally, I'll kind of uh, unify them. Um, on Poisson groupoids. So that's that's the idea. So let me start with the first topic, which is Poisson Lie groups. So I'll be basically using the mostly using the blackboard. So oh, oh. I'm sure this will happen again. Oh, here we go. Yeah, all right. I feel a bit um, funny like that. But okay, so the first topic is... Poisson Lie groups. So that's really the first. Inst I think it's historically that, that's something that I should also say. So basically, um, I could have, you know, planned this talk to just start with the most general result I know about this correspondence, and then, you know, study particular cases. But I chose to do the other way around. So basically, I'll, I'll, I'll follow the historical evolution of of these ideas. Okay. So the first example or related to Poisson geometry of a multiplicative structure is that of a Poisson Lie group and this appeared in the in the early 80s basically in the work of Dreamfeld and Semenov Tianshansky and, and and this came up in the context when they were studying um, integrable systems which is also a topic that Rui talked about um, so the definition is as follows so suppose that you have a Lie group Um, and you say that I'll consider a Poisson structure in this Lie group. I'll represent it as this tensor that we also talked about today. And um, we say that 
this Poisson structure is multiplicative if the following happens. If the multiplication map of the Lie group is a Poisson map. And so let me give you a couple of, of um, equivalent ways or some general properties that just follow from the definition of this object. <coughs> ah, and of course this is this is what um, a Lie group with a multiplicative Poisson structure. is what is called the Poisson Lie group. So just um, something that is easy to check. You can even, you can even put it as an exercise. So check the following. This is equivalent, this meaning the multiplicativity condition for a Poisson structure is equivalent to an equation. So you can write this as an equation as follows. And this may be, so this may be convenient. Right, so it's it's basically follows from the definition, but it's nice to have in mind. And um, an initial property that follows from this definition of compatibility between the Poisson structure and the Lie group operation is that the inversion from G to G is an anti-Poisson map. So, you know, it's basically, it, it's a Poisson map up to a sign. <clears throat> and um, another exercise is also something fairly simple to check, is that, um, so basically, at the identity of the Lie group, a multiplicative Poisson structure has to be zero. So basically, this is very easy from this formula directly to check. And, um, and there is another key property that is satisfied, which is that if you take the Lie derivative of a multiplicative bivector or multiplicative Poisson structure, this is right or respectively left invariant whenever x is right respectively left invariant and we'll see why this property is so important so um, just notice that you know even though the first definition, um, in principle, you wouldn't really know how to generalize it to other multivector fields on the Lie group, right? This one makes sense in principle for any for any pi, which is a multivector. And, um, and in this case, this property still holds. So there's nothing about being Poisson or a bivector. It's just something about multivectors. And um, you know, the, the other part of the exercise would be to check that in fact, so this implies this in general, and in fact, there is an equivalence. You can go back and prove an equivalence if G is connected. 
So these are some other ways to express this compatibility between, between Lie groups and Poisson structures. <coughs> So just some very simple examples of course you know there's a very beautiful theory of Poisson Lie groups and this could be the subject of the entire course so I'll have to be very brief about them so obviously a very non-interesting example is just any Lie group whatsoever if you put the trivial Poisson structure so, but I have to say that anyway. Um, another example is, if you look at a vector space, and you look at this vector space as an abelian Lie group with respect to addition, then a Poisson structure on this vector space, viewed as a, you know, as a manifold, um, is multiplicative if and only if it's linear in the sense that the Poisson bracket of linear functions is linear again. Okay, so these are exactly the type of things that happen on the dual of the algebra. This is in fact equivalent to saying that the dual of the vector space has a Lie algebra structure. So in particular <clears throat> the dual of a Lie algebra can be seen as a Poisson Lie group with respect to addition, right? With this KKS um, linear po um, Poisson structure, and um, perhaps more interesting, more more interesting example is. Um, I will just briefly mention, I don't know if I have enough space here, I will just move here. This was an important announcement, I hope everyone read. Um, okay, so the other example three is if you have a Lie group with Lie algebra then suppose that you choose an element it's a bivector on the Lie algebra like that <coughs> so you can define out of this bivector on the Lie algebra, a bivector field on the Lie group in a very simple way. So basically, you take right, you, know, you can use right translations to spread this bivector over the Lie group. You can also use left translations to do that, and you can take this difference. And um, it's a very easy exercise to check that this is always multiplicative. <clears throat> um, it's a very simple computation. And it's also very simple to find a criterion to see when this is in fact a Poisson structure. There's an integrability condition missing in principle. So it's also very easy to, to figure out what, in, you know, what, what the condition on lambda for the resulting bivector field to be integrable, to be a Poisson structure. And the condition is that, so basically pi is Poisson and therefore defines a Poisson Lie group structure if and only if, if you take the, the bracket of lambda with itself, and here this is the so-called skeleton bracket. It's just a extension of the Lie bracket um, on, on, the, on, the, on the Lie algebra to its exterior powers. So there, there's a natural way in which, in which you can extend them, and um, so this this has to be adding variant. So that's the condition. 
So this gives lots of um, examples and important examples. In this case, if this happens, you call lambda an R matrix. And um, a particular case of adding variance is just if this guy lambda with lambda is zero, and that's the so-called Young-Baxter equation that appears in the theory of integrable systems. So that's a particular, the classical Young-Baxter equation. So it's a particular case. So to give a concrete example, you consider, for example, the group SU2, and you consider its Lie algebra, And this Lie algebra is very easy to describe. Um, well, just R3 with a vector product anyway. But um, so <clears throat> you can find the basis where it just looks like this. And, um, and it's very, well, and, and obviously in this case, this space is just spanned by by this vector. And it's very easy to see that this vector, you know, it's, it's adding variant. So if we just bracket this with any basis element using this bracket relations, this will be zero. So this, will, this is um, automatically um, adding variant, and therefore any, in this case, any lambda on wedge 2 of G um, defines a Poisson Lee group, gives a multiplicative. Right here, you just apply this criterion to see that you know if you, if you take bracket of lambda and lambda, it would be just a constant multiple of this guy. But because this guy is adding variant, this will be adding variant as well, and you're done. Okay, so this gives lots of examples. So one of the questions that I'll be addressing, well, with some luck today, if not tomorrow, is, um, is how to describe. Well, some Lie groups in terms of Lie algebra data, right? So we have a we have a Lie group that infinitesimal is a Lie algebra. So I'm, I'm equipping this Lie group with something extra, and infinitesimally this should, this should correspond to something extra on the Lie algebra. So I'll discuss um, I'll discuss that. So now let's move. Let's move to groupoids so that I can define more multiplicative structures for you. <clears throat> so we're going to move to, to groupoids. Um, so here. <clears throat> There will be one example to have in mind. So the, the, the prototypical example will be for us, interested in, in, in Poisson geometry, the cotangent bundle of a Lie group. So we know that this is canonically a symplectic manifold. But as we'll see, this also has a group-like structure that is reminiscent from the fact that you know, you're not taking the cotangent bundle of any manifold, but of a Lie group. And, um, and this, so this will be a groupoid, naturally. This is also a symplectic manifold. And the next step will be to explain in which sense they are compatible. So the first thing then is to really tell you what Lie groupoids are and try to convince you that they are of interest in, in Poisson geometry. So, uh, it, it, you see, I've, I've been to many, countless, 
um, lectures where the groupoids are introduced. And, you know, it's always the same slide, axiom, a bunch of, you know, one slide with a bunch of axioms, and, you know, the first key examples. And my impression is that what always happens is that those who know what Lie groupoids are, you know, get really bored. And those who don't know kind of just get confused and they can't even read all the axioms. So I decided to try something a little different. And um, so what I'll try is that, you know, I'm going to flash the same slide with all the axioms and give the same examples. But before that, I'm going to ask you to talk to your neighbors and ask your neighbor if your neighbor knows what a Lie groupoid is. And try to get a one minute definition. And um, I will forbid the mantra, right? Small category where all arrows are invertible. <laughs> this is not allowed, okay? As this is not allowed as a definition. So please meet your neighbor, see if he knows what a Lie groupoid is, and try to get an explanation of what a Lie groupoid is in one minute. And then I'll flash the slide. Someone, find someone to talk to. So hopefully you learn more in this one minute than what you will learn in the next five minutes when I talk about what a Lie groupoid is. So, um, all right. So here's the formal definition. Okay. So the general idea is that um, this will be um, this will be basic, basically a manifold that will have you know a group-like operation, but the main difference is that this, this operation is not defined for any pairs of elements on this manifold. You only have a partially defined multiplication. And in order to, to define what partially defined means, um, you equipped this manifold G, that will be the Lie groupoid in the end, with two maps to another manifold, M, that, that will be called the base of the groupoid, and um, in such a way that you can talk about um, composable pairs. So the composable pairs of the Lie group uh, of this manifold G will be the pairs G A G H, so that you know the the the, the source, which is the S map um, of G, matches the target of of um, of H by T, right? The target of H. So um, so here's a so a picture to have in mind. Is that you know usually if you want you can draw M here and then you represent the elements of G as arrows where this is the image of G by the by the source map and this points to the image of G through the target map. And this is such a way that the composable ones are those that look like this. Oops. Yeah, so let me keep my notation. So 
So this will be now also the source of G, and this is the target of G. Right. So this is um, in a picture what the what the comp you know composability is. So you have you know a multiplication map for composable pairs. You also have something that will be a diffeomorphism of G that will be the, the inverse, the inversion of elements. And you also have an embedding of M, of these base manifolds, back into G that will play the role of units. So basically, each element um, here of, of the base, so you know, if you call this element X, will be represented by an arrow, but this arrow will be special in that it begins and ends at the same point. And that's this guy, also the note 1 base x. And there will be the natural axioms for the group composition. So the axioms are as follows. So you have a composition law which says that if you have, if you have three arrows, which are composable, then composing the first two and getting a resulting arrow, and then co composing with the third one is the same thing as you know, composing the last two, getting a resulting arrow, and composing that with the first one. This gives the same result. right? The second one, well, that's the, the associativity law. Um, <clears throat> the, the first, the first um, Composition law just says that the resulting arrow, when you compose G and H, is something that starts where H starts and ends where G ends. Then you have associativity and you have the law of units. So basically, it's saying that you know once you embed M inside G through these arrows, you know when you compose this arrow with something that you know starts at this point, you don't change it. It's like a unit, right? And the same thing if you compose on the left with something that ends at this point. So that's the other one. And then you have the law of inverses, basically saying that you know, if you have an arrow like this, the inverse will go the other way, and if you compose them, you get one of these unit arrows. Okay, but each point has its own identity. Okay, so that's what a Lie groupoid um, is. <clears throat> so let me give you some examples, so the canonical examples. So first of all, um, any manifold can be obviously seen as a Lie groupoid. You just set G to be equal to M, so the base and you know G and M are just the same manifold, and source and, and, and target are just the identity maps. So it's not um, that interesting. Um, out of a manifold, there are a few other groupoids that you can consider. Uh, one is the so-called pair groupoid. So this pair groupoid does the following. Let me just write it here. So basically, you compose... You compose pairs, so the compatibility condition is that you know, this entry of this pair agrees with the first entry of the next pair and the result of the operation is just to delete this guy and you have this as the resulting element on the pair. Right? So as an exercise try to figure out what the identities are and everything else you may want to know. Right? And um, there is another, there is a more sophisticated version of this groupoid called the fundamental groupoid. Um, in which case, you know, G now is given not, not just by pairs, but in fact by paths relating points, or better speaking, um, homotopy classes of paths relating points. Right? And then, you know, the, the condition for the groupoid operation is that one path ends where the next one starts, and then the groupoid operation is concatenation of paths. Okay, so this is also a Lie groupoid over M, right? So this one is a kind of you know a, a, a similar to this one, except that I'm only taking the endpoints of the path. 
Um, obviously, if I just take the base M to be a point, then a Lie group point reduces just to a Lie group, right? So um, Lie groups are, are, are very simple examples of group points. Perhaps a more interesting example is that of a G manifold. So if you have a manifold that is acted on by a Lie group, then you can combine the manifold and the Lie group and the action into a Lie groupoid that represents everything. So basically, um, as a manifold, the groupoid G will be just the direct product of the Lie group and the manifold M. This will be a groupoid over M. And, um, and the groupoid operation in this case is very, is very simple. So basically, the source and target, so if you have an element of the Lie group and the point of the manifold, then in this case, the source is just X itself, and the target is just where X goes once you apply G to, G to it. Okay, and then you can figure out what the composition law is um, very easily. So basically, if you take GX, and then if you have here a Y um, H, then you know this has to be where X goes under G, right? That's the compatibility condition, and the resulting here, the result here is just this. So it has in it the group structure. Okay, so you, you know this, all these examples, uh, they are simple enough that you can just play with them and extract all the structure maps and and understand what you want to understand. So, all right. So there are a few things that I should tell you. Like these are general features of um, a group, like general. Certain ingredients that a Lie groupoid has, and some of them are pretty essential. So the first one is the notion of an orbit, right? So it's clear that you know if you have a groupoid over a manifold M, this defines an equivalence relation on M. The equivalence relation is um, you say that you know x and y are related if there is a G that has source x and target y. Right? And if you take the equivalence classes according to this, to this equivalence relation, um, these are called the orbits. So basically, any groupoid induces on the manifold some kind of um, decomposition. And in the case of a Lie groupoid, it's really a decomposition into leaves. These are all manifolds, submanifolds. Obviously, uh, potentially of different dimension. Right? So in the case um, of. of um, of the group point of a G manifold, these are just the orbits of the Lie group, just the orbits of the action. So the other element that is very important is the so-called isotropy group. So the isotropy group at a point is just given by all the errors, uh, arrows that begin and end at that same point. And these you are freely to compose. You are free to compose. They compose without any extra compatibility because they all look like this. Right? So, for example, the isotropy groups of the, of the fundamental groupoid, they are nothing but the fundamental group at the specific base point that you, that you choose. Right? And the orbits of the fundamental groupoid are the um, components, the path components of the manifold. So, all the, all the points that you can reach from a fixed point through a path. Um, and you know there, there's another object associated with the Lie groupoid um, called a bisection, and it's important because these bisections they actually form a group. So there is a group that a groupoid encodes, and um, and this is a kind of um, you know, in many cases play the role of symmetries of, of the base manifold. So I think the picture to have in mind are these bisections. And these are the only three things I'll tell you about groupoids, besides the definition. So I think the the picture to have in mind for these bisections is that so here you have your base manifold M, 
and you can draw here so this is a, also a common picture to represent groupoids so these are the S fibers and um, I may have other colors here and you can also draw T fibers and um, so note that you know in this picture the the way the composition works for example is that this point has target here and this point has source here and you can compose them and you get something here you know whose source is the source of the first and whose target is the target of the second and um, these bisections what they are really these are just submanifolds of the groupoid that project diffeomorphically onto M both through T through target and through source maps okay and why can you why, why can you multiply them now it's very simple so basically if you choose any point here right and you see its source you're gonna see that there's only one uh, point at the other bisection whose target is that just this one and these two guys you can compose so you just compose so you do this for all the points right so this is a group operation on the space of bisections Right, so you can even make an analytical sense of this group as some kind of infinite dimensional um, Lie group. But um, it's often, you know, it's often better to just, you know, work with the groupoid, which is something finite dimensional that you can play with without worrying about analysis, and um, and having the the bisection just, you know, encoding something else or something in there. Okay, so I think that was what I wanted to say about group OIs. So I, I will also mention, but I'll let you figure out how to make sense of left translation and right translations. Okay, so think about it. I mean, how do you make sense of those? You have to be careful because you cannot, you know, operate any any element of the groupoid with a given G only those whose, source, whose sources match its target and the same thing here so left and right operation um, translations are, are defined but not on the, on, the whole, on the whole space right, it plays only with fibers of the T map and the S map okay, so let me move on and now that I have groupoids I will define the first multiplicative structure on, um, on a groupoid. <coughs> okay, let me erase here. So as I said, the example to have in mind is the cotangent bundle of a Lie group. Right? <coughs> so why is that? So the cotangent bundle of a Lie group, as an example, as a model example. So first of all, this is a groupoid in a very natural way. So basically, you can see uh, this as one of these action groupoids, the, the groupoids that come from, from actions. So basically, you can trivialize this, right? So <coughs> you can view this as a manifold like this, and G acts on G star through the coadjoint coadjoint action. So I have a Lie group, I have a manifold where it acts, I can form a groupoid out of that. Right? So this is usually denoted like this. The action groupoid. So this says that this acts here. So this gives T star of G a groupoid structure. And as I said, we all know that this is also symplectic. It has a canonical symplectic form. And what I'm going to do now is, is explain in which way these two geometrical structures are compatible. So, 
Um, so here's a definition. So a definition that goes back to Weinstein and Karazev. And um, I'll explain you know, where, where it came from in a second. So let's just start with the definition. I'm running out of uh, white chalk. So suppose that you have a groupoid, so the usual notation is like this, and you have a symplectic form. Then, so the pair G omega is a symplectic groupoid if the following condition um, holds if you look at the graph of the multiplication map of the groupoid so this is given by points g h and g times h where g and h are composable If this is a Lagrangian submanifold in the product G times G times G bar, where G bar just means um, the symplectic manifold with minus the symplectic form. Okay, so that's the that's the compatibility condition. So it's a symplectic groupoid if this condition here happens, holds. So notice that, you know, it's kind of tricky to make sense of, you know, you could say something about the map M, just like I did for Poisson Lie groups. In the case of Poisson Lie groups, I just said that the map M was a Poisson map. But what's the problem now? The problem now is that on a groupoid, the multiplication map is just defined on the, in this composable pairs and in principle the composable pairs have no structure right you know that g is symplectic g times g is symplectic but the submanifold in there you don't know so it's kind of hard to make sense of what this map should satisfy you know unless you have this picture of canonical relations in mind so um, so that's the that's the condition that um, Weinstein and, and Karas have um, came up with so you know this already suggests that this point of view to symplectic geometry in which morphisms are seen as Lagrangian submanifolds of products so this is a picture that um, was I think um, quite promoted in, in, in the beginning by, by Guillaume and Steinberg and then by Alan Weinstein that you have a kind of symplectic category in which morphisms are like range and submanifolds of products, but this is not really a category because you cannot really compose them always, only if you have you know, transversality conditions. But um, so the, the, the initial motivation was this quantization dictionary that um, a bunch of you may have seen before. So this is basically uh, some kind of table of analogies between the so-called symplectic category and the quantum category, there should be just the category of linear spaces, of vector spaces, right? So in, the, in this correspondence, you know, for many symplectic manifolds, or for, for classes of symplectic manifolds, you can actually, you know, basically find something like that. For example, you know, geometric quantization, um, you know, pre-quantization and polarization, whenever this works out well. Um, so in this dictionary, symplectic manifolds should correspond to you know, vector spaces or Hermitian vector spaces. And if you change the sign of the symplectic form, this should be related to the dual. Products go to the tensor products. Therefore, if you take the product of a symplectic manifold with the, the bar of the other, this should be a homomorphism space. Right? It's just, um, it's just um, V1 tensor V2 star. And um, the question that, that Weinstein, at least, was trying to address was, you know, what happens if, you know, you want to find on the geometric side something that would play the role of an algebra, of a star algebra, right? So what is an algebra? An algebra is a vector space where you put an extra structure. This is given by some kind of bilinear map of that vector space. And you also have an involution, 
right? But you know that you know homomorphism spaces are related, um, you know, to products, and 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 maps are related by like to Lagrangian submanifolds. So basically, you know, if you think a little bit about this dictionary. Um, you, 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 you get the definition of what a symplectic groupoid is. So, you know, it's a symplectic manifold, which is like the vector space, with additional structures that basically play the role of, you know, what a star um, algebra should be. Okay, so that's how this first came up. <coughs> Good. So, let me say a few things about about um, symplectic groupoids now. So the first observation is an exercise. So the first observation is just an exercise. Suppose that you have a symplectic form on a Lie groupoid. So then the condition that this graph of the multiplication is Lagrangian, is a Lagrangian submanifold of this triple product here, is equivalent to an equation. And the equation is just. this equation where here perhaps I should tell you what I'm doing so basically there are three ways in which I can project from composable pairs to G so one is using the multiplication the other one is just projecting the first factor and the, and, the, and the other one is projecting on the second factor so that's what this equation here is so um, so this exercise well, you know, there's a bit of dimension counting there. So basically, you can easily see, just as a hint, that this condition here says that this graph is isotropic. That's actually equivalent. So this is equivalent to this being isotropic. But then you just count dimensions in the case that for if, if you have a two-form that is non-degenerate, you just count dimensions, and then you realize that it automatically has half dimension. Okay, but only for non-degenerate forms. So there's a bit of dimension counting there. And um, there are a few properties of symplectic groupoids that follow immediately just from this compatibility definition. Right, so just one equation. So what are the conditions? So one is that this identity this unit map, the, the map that embeds M in G as unit, is Lagrangian. The image is a Lagrangian submanifold. The second is that the inversion on the groupoid is anti-symplectic. So it's a symplectic map up to a sign. And um, the other, so there's another one that is important, which tells you something about um, how, how the S fibers and T fibers are related. And um, so if you look at the tangent of the S fibers and at the tangent to the T fibers on the groupoid, they are related by one just being the symplectic orthogonal of the other. So in particular, if you pull back functions from the base through T and S to the groupoid, they Poisson commute up there. So these are pretty simple properties that one can check more or less immediately. So there is one more important property that will link this business with Ruiz talk or lectures. 
which is the following. So this is another property, important. So there is a unique Poisson structure on M. Okay, so now I'm in the context of a symplectic groupoid over a manifold. So in principle, there's nothing on M. I'm just putting a structure on here, on G. Right, so there's a unique Poisson structure that is induced by this compatibility condition on M. Um, for which the T map, the target map, is a Poisson map. Okay. So there's not there's not nothing special about about T. You know S in this case would be automatically an untyped Poisson map. Okay? But this would also determine this thing uniquely. Okay? So there is a Poisson structure that appears here. Right. Um, and um, if, you, if you prove these properties, then this is kind of simple to check. So the exercise here. So this follows from um, a criterion, I guess, of Lieberman that basically tells you, you know, if you have a symplectic manifold and if you have a map onto another manifold, which is a surjective submersion, you know, when can you bring the symplectic structure down? and define a Poisson structure here so that this is a Poisson map. Right? You certainly need some kind of invariance of the, you know, of the, of the symplectic structure. So if we talked about, you know, Lie groups acting here, preserving the symplectic form, then you can do it. But what about the more general problem of, you know, symplectic manifold, surjective submersion, when can you find a Poisson structure down here? Okay, so here's a criteria. So, Suppose that you have, so let me call the symplectic manifold S, and you have a map P, which is a surjective submersion, and suppose that it has connected fibers. So suppose, so let's F be um, the foliation whose fibers are um, the fibers of P of this map. Then, so the the the, the result then is that. So there exists unique um, Poisson structure on M um, such that the projection is a Poisson map if and only if really seriously running out of space here, if and only if the distribution tangent to the P fibers, the symplectic orthogonal of that is involutive, is integrable. So it's tangent to a foliation as well. Okay, and this is exactly the case here. So if you look at the T fibers and you look at their symplectic orthogonal, you get the S fibers. Right? And this is certainly tangent to leaves, so you're done. So try to. I think this is um, kind of interesting to, to work out. So I think already. Let me just have a look at what 
Okay, so let me just, I just have one more slide, so let me just go over it. <clears throat> okay, so first of all, you know, this immediately relates this existence of, of simple, you know, symplectic group points to symplectic realizations, right? So one natural question would be, so that's a question that, you know, a lot of people have, have worked on, is if you're given a Poisson manifold, can you find a symplectic groupoid that realizes this Poisson manifold like that? There is to say, so that the target map of this of this groupoid, you know, is a Poisson map onto the given Poisson manifold that you that you have. Can you do that? So let me just say that um, doing that for the dual of the Lie algebra is essentially the same as integrating the Lie algebra itself. And in fact, that's how you know. Lee proved his theorem. He went to the dual of the Lie algebra, he found a symplectic realization, so to say, of that, right? And from that, he, he found the Lie group. Um, okay, so, um, so this is, you know, symplectic group points are intimately related to symplectic realizations and to um, this kind of integration problem. Okay, so this is an issue. And even like back in the, in the days where these things were introduced, um, I think even Weissing himself noticed that not every Poisson manifold can be realized like that. And now we have very precise obstructions for this to happen um, from the work of Marius and Rui. <coughs> so where has this been used? So symplectic groupoids naturally appear in a variety of contexts. So for example, um, they are useful tools to study symmetries and moment maps. So uh, I wish I had time to say a few words about, about that. They appear um, as classical phase spaces of certain sigma models in, 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 in physics, called Poisson sigma models. And maybe Rui will say a few words about that, but they are a very useful tool um, for the global study of Poisson manifolds. So they even appear in recent um, um, proofs of, 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 of linearization um, results. Okay, so I did not talk about Poisson groupoids. I'll do this next class, but um, just make sure that there's nothing else. Yeah, so I mean, there, there is one, you know, now we, we have on the one hand, let me just show this. So we have on the, on the one hand Poisson Lie groups, which are Poisson structures compatible with Lie group structures. We, thought, we saw what Lie group points are. You know, I, I told you what compatible symplectic structures are on Lie group points. Through this lemma, you can now, you know, just use an equation to make sense of what multiplicative structures on group points are in general. But this can be any K form now. It doesn't have to be closed, it doesn't have to be anything. Okay? So we have a notion now of um, multiplicative um, forms in general on, on, on groupoids. So the next thing I wanted to mention, just like following this historical evolution, was the notion of a Poisson groupoid that was also introduced by Weinstein that unifies Poisson Lie groups and symplectic groupoids. And then I'll start talking about their infinitesimal counterparts. Okay? So that's what I'm going to do tomorrow. Thanks.